All right, folks, so welcome to lesson three of our Java series, Conditions and Loops. This one's going to be a little bit tricky. Um, this is where a lot of people tend to have some trouble, okay? So as always, if you have questions or problems, interrupt me and ask for help or ask for clarification or whatever it is that you need. And for those of you who will be watching this video later, uh, watching it online, you can always ask for help in Discord. I fixed the video so that you can actually see the link to Discord in the recording now. I should be appearing up in the top right-hand corner of the recording instead of the bottom left. And so you should be able to see that now. All right, so any questions before we get started? Cool, let's dive in. So what we will cover today, what is a condition? We'll cover Boolean logic. Remember Boolean being true or false from our data types in past class? Uh, we'll cover if conditions, which is one type of condition. And then we'll cover switch case conditions, which is another type of condition. And then we'll move on to the second half with what is a loop. And then we will cover the two types of loops, while loops and for loops. There are also different subtypes, but we're not going to cover all of them today, just the basics. Once you learn these, if you need to learn the subtypes, that should be easier for you to do on your own. Okay? Good? All right, let's get to it. So what is a condition? A condition is how your program can make decisions. The logic is very simple, but very powerful. It's how we humans work too. If this, then that. If something is true, then I'm going to do this. Now in some way, computer, in some ways, computers are actually better at this than we are because uh, computers should always behave the same based on how they're programmed. But we, uh, we don't do that. So you need to be careful with your conditions because it will do exactly what you tell it to do. So make sure to tell it to do the right thing. Now, um, when you're working in conditions, you can also say, hey, if that wasn't true, do this other thing instead. Okay? And you can chain conditions. So you can say something, if this one thing is true, do that. But if that's not true, and instead this other thing is true, do something else. And then you can say, hey, if none of those are true at all, do this instead. Okay, so you get all sorts of branching logic and you can make interesting, you can have your program make interesting decisions. Does that make sense? Cool. Now these can all be combined and nested inside each other. So you can have a condition inside a condition inside a condition with chaining and uh, when conditions aren't met and all these kinds of things, okay? You can make it as complex as you want. That said though, you need to be careful because if you make it too complex, it's gonna be harder for you to understand later. It's gonna be harder for other engineers to understand, but we'll get to that later, okay? So far so good? All right. So before we dive into conditions, Conditions are based on truth, right? If something is true, then do something else, right? True is a Boolean, Boolean being true or false. So we should spend a little bit of time understanding Boolean logic, okay? How do we work with true and false? Many things can be true or false, right? I am standing in front of a table, that is true. But if your idea of front is different, it may not be true, right? Um, so all kinds of crazy things like this. Now, comparison operators are operators you can use that always evaluate to true or false. Actually, a little typo there. I should say evaluate to Boolean. So greater than. If you use a greater than, it's going to output, let's say, true or false. Less than. Equal to. Okay? And this, is, uh, this should serve as a good reference for you. Okay? You basically have the symbol followed by its meaning. Okay? So if you write 5 greater than 10 that whole thing will become the value true, okay? If you write five, or except that's not true, that whole thing will become false, okay? Um, so it's a, it's a way to basically test conditions, okay? Less than, or greater than, less than, equal to is done with two equal signs, okay? Be careful about that, because one equal sign is assigning to a variable, right? That's a different operation. Two equal signs is an equality comparison. Okay, so that can be confusing. Be careful about that. You also have greater than or equal to. 
and less than or equal to. All of these are very useful. You will use them very often. Okay. Now, in addition to using these comparison operators, you can use any Boolean value, right? So anything that's true or false. Now, this means you can use variables that are Boolean types, or you can use functions that output Booleans. For example, the string has a special function called equals. This dot right here, we haven't covered that yet, but just know that if you have a string and you want to check for equality, you do dot equals. Okay, you'll learn what exactly that means later. And then you have another string. This is a function call. And this function will produce a Boolean value. It will output a Boolean value, either true or false. Okay. Lastly, you can use the not operator, which is the bang symbol, the exclamation point symbol, to switch between true and false. So bang true is false. Bang false is very good. All right, questions about that so far? Cool. This looks a little scary. I promise you it's not, OK? We mentioned the not operator already, OK? But you can use Boolean operators to make, or you can use other Boolean operators to make more complex conditions. For example, you can put multiple conditions together. So if I have A, right? Let's say that A is some variable that has false stored inside of it, OK? And let's say B has some variable that stores false inside of it, OK? If I do not A, what do I get? Correct. Now, these are the comparison operators, these three. I'm sorry, getting my words mixed up. These are not comparison operators. These are three Boolean operators, OK? Not, and, and or, OK? And is done with two ampersands, or is done with two pipes. The ampersand on a US and I believe Korean keyboard is shift and then the number seven. The pipe, that's a little harder to find. On a US keyboard, it's a shift backslash, backslash being the key above enter. However, on some Korean keyboards and some European keyboards, your pipe or backslash could be next to your backspace key. Okay? So take some time to, uh, to check what that looks like. On some keyboards, it looks like just a vertical line. On other keyboards, it looks like a vertical line with a little break in the middle of it. OK? So does everyone find their, uh, their pipe symbol? Cool. You will need to use it. All right? Um, now, why is it double ampersands and double pipes? Single ampersands and single pipes are used for binary operations, which we are not learning. You're not going to do that. <laughs> That's very rare. Maybe when you get into way more advanced stuff, you'll be doing that. But we're not going to bother with that during this class, during this whole series, OK? So double ampersand is and, double pipes is, is or, OK? Now, what do, these means in term, what do these mean in terms of Boolean operations? And we'll evaluate to true if both sides are true, OK? So if A is true and B is true, this whole thing will become true. Or will be true if one or both of them are true. OK, so if A is true and B is true, it'll be true. OK, if A is false and B is false, it'll be false. If one of them is true, say, say A is true and B is false, A true, B false still becomes true. If there's at least one truth, the whole thing is true in an or, OK? Now, if you guys have taken a logic class or kind of a proofs class in some sort of university or other schooling, you may also be wondering about like XOR or NAND or those other Boolean operators. You can do all of those operators using these three operators, OK? If you don't know what those things are, don't worry about it, OK? So not and an or. Uh, and you can use this truth table as a reference. Uh, if you think through the logic, you can always figure it out on your own. But when you're first learning, sometimes it's just easier to look at this. So use this as a reference. OK? Questions? Cool. All right, moving forward. All right, now for code. 
if conditions. This is the first of the two types of conditions we'll cover. An if condition takes this format. You have the if keyword followed by parentheses. What's inside the parentheses is checking if it's true or false, okay? So this can be a comparison operator, it can be a function call, it can be a variable, whatever evaluates to Boolean true or false, all right? And then, then after the parentheses, we have the curly brackets, and this is the code well, that will execute if what's in the parentheses is true, okay? So if the part in parentheses is true, then the part in curly brackets will run. If the part in parentheses is not true, the code between the curly brackets will not run. This will be skipped. So if this were false, this would not print. Does that make sense? Cool, questions? Great. This is what it looks like when you want to do a different action, right? So let's say that this is not true. I literally wrote not true, <laughs> okay? Just as practice. This will never run, okay? This is skipped, like we just mentioned. There's another keyword called else, okay? Else has no additional condition, okay? Else runs if all of the chained ifs above it, we only have one right now, but if the, if the, uh, if the condition above it is not true, then the else will run. Okay, as you saw here, we don't need an else, else is optional, okay? But if this is not true, then this will run. Okay, questions? Cool, again, the curly brackets denote the code that will be run by the condition operator, okay? So chaining, okay? We mentioned earlier that you could chain conditions. If this is true, then do this. If it's not, then check this one. Okay, check this one, check this one, so on and so forth. Okay, this is condition chaining. We have this condition right here. Is five greater than 10? So what does this evaluate to? False. Correct, it is false. So then it's going to skip this and it's gonna to go to the next else, okay? Now here we have another if. This is a chained condition. It will only check this if, if this one is false. Otherwise it will skip this. If this is true, nothing else in this chain happens. It skips the rest, okay? Now is five less than 10? Five is less than 10. So this is true. Don't worry, I, I, I've, been doing, I've been doing that kind of stuff all day <laughs> trying to get this stuff to work. All right, so this is true. So that means what's in these curly brackets will run, all right? And then since this is true, this else will be skipped, all right? Does that make sense? Does anyone have questions? Is this difficult, easy, understandable, but takes some effort? How do you guys feel about it? It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Understanding it is maybe easy for some people, but writing it's going to be harder. Yeah. All right. Questions before we move on? Cool. So let's, um, real quick, let's do, I'm going to change the way we do things a little bit. Previously, we did uh, presentation, 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 writing code, right? What I'm going to try to do moving forward, if if you guys end up liking it, if it ends up helping you guys, is I'll kind of mix them. We'll do a little bit of presentation, a little bit of cold code, a little bit of presentation, a little bit of code, okay? All right, so let's try this. So I'm gonna make a new folder. Uh, now, you guys can either work along with this if you want, or you can just watch, it's your choice. At the end, I'm gonna recommend we all do it together, but for the in-between stuff, you don't have to if you don't want to, your choice. So zero, three, uh, conditions and loops. All right, and I'm gonna make a new file. I'm gonna, or why does it here? I'll do it this way. Click new file here, and I'm gonna call it conditions.java. Get rid of all this other junk that shows up. 
Are you guys uh are you guys following along? Okay, cool. Then uh I'll go a little more slowly. So class conditions, just like normal. How are we doing on time? Not bad. All right, so we're also gonna do our main function. For practice, who can remember how it goes without looking? It's okay, You get, I, no, one, no one's gonna take the time to set it. Public, what's next, yes. Nope, try again. Good guess, but try again. Public static void, yep. Yep. Parentheses, yep. Do you remember the rest? Yeah. Oh, really good. Square brackets, yep. Yep. Whoa. Good job, Sam. That is impressive. Very good job. For those on video, or for those watching the video, he was he was looking at the screen as he was saying that he at, at the at the screen we're all working on. He wasn't looking at he, there was no cheating there. It's pretty good. All right, so let's do a let's uh let's do a condition practice. I'm going to uh, define a variable boolean. Whoa, hello. All right. I could just hard code it, but just to kind of demonstrate and practice using kind of obfuscated. Boolean values, like stored inside something rather than just writing true or false directly. I'm going to write a Boolean called is true, and I'm going to set it to true. Okay. Now, in the real world, this is completely unnecessary, but for our purposes, it's just practice. All right. So now I'm going to try writing a condition. If is true, whoops. Then system dot out dot print line true is true. You guys got that? Don't forget to save. Don't forget to save. Don't forget to save. All right, I'm going to open up my term. We're going to test this. We're going to open up our terminal. Click terminal at the top. Click new terminal. Or if you're really fancy, you can do control shift tilde. And I'm not sure what it is on Mac. You're right, but I want you guys to get practice with this. Eventually, we will ditch the terminal. But for now, I want you guys to practice this. OK? So Java C, conditions.java. And then Java conditions. And you should see true is true printed. All right. Has everyone got this? Oh, good job. Sorry, I was watching her screen. <laughs> Okay, excellent. So let's let's do a little more. Actually, uh, I said we weren't going to do functions earlier when I was talking before the recording, but eh, for practice, let's go ahead and do a function. Okay, I'm going to create a new function. Actually, forget the public static boolean, right? We only do static because the main needs it to be static. Later, we'll learn how to not do that, but for now, just please do that. I want to make a function called return true. And guess what it's going to do? Everyone's too busy typing. It's going to return true. <laughs> All 
All right, has everyone got that? All right, so let's try a condition with a function. You don't have to write exactly what I wrote. Just something to get the point across. On that note, though, let's... All right, is everyone good? All right, so let's compile it again and run it again. There we go. This is kind of a this is kind of an exercise in understanding how substitution works, right? Because this variable is true; it's storing a true value, right? So what Java will do is it'll look at that variable pull the true value out of it and put it in the condition, all right? Same thing with return true. Return true, when you execute it, it does whatever it's supposed to do, and then whatever the output is gets substituted here, okay? So it's like as if I wrote if true, okay? Does that make sense? Does anyone have questions about that? How about how function output and variable substitution and these kinds of things work? Does anyone have questions about why these both evaluated to true? Or does everyone understand that? It's OK to say you don't understand. That's why we're here. You don't understand. Great. I'm so glad you said that. OK. Which one? This one, this one, or both? Both. OK, great. So I'll explain maybe more slowly and differently. For variables, do you remember the, the box metaphor we used? You have a box of a certain size that has a label and has something inside it, right? So this is true variable is a box with the label is true. The size, it stores a Boolean, okay? And what do we put in the box? Okay, we put the value true in the box, perfect. Now, whenever I reference the name of the box, whenever I reference the variable, what Java's gonna do is it's gonna take that box, it's gonna go, oh, your is true, this is the one I want. And it's gonna take the value out of the box and put it there. So it goes from is true to the value true. Okay, that's variable substitution. Okay, it takes the value inside the variable, what's in the box, and substitutes it for the box. Okay, does that make more sense now? Great. And then return true is kind of similar. Okay, this is a function, right? It's not a variable, no box, right? However, it still behaves a little similarly. Return true has an output value, right? It outputs a Boolean, all right? So whatever is returned by this function will take the place of the call, okay? So because it outputs a Boolean, whatever Boolean it outputs replaces it here, okay? So what's gonna replace it there? True, because that's what we're outputting here. Does that make more sense now? Cool. So you understand how this works? Excellent, cool. Anyone else have questions? Anyone feel like it's not quite clicking for them? You know I like to wait a little bit. Cool. All right, so um, we can do, let's do, uh, so on the code that I'm going to post, I actually have a lot more examples, okay? Or not code that I'm going to post, code that I posted three years ago. Um, there's a lot more examples. We're not gonna do all of them here, but let's do one more, okay? If I do something like, uh, if two is less than one, is that gonna be true or false? Correct, okay? So because of this uh, comparison operator, this gets substituted for false, 
Okay. Now, system.out.println. This won't happen. Okay, no surprises there, right? Give everyone a minute to catch up. Is everyone with me? All right, good to continue. I'm noticing there's still some looking back and forth, so I'll wait a minute. All right, so this is going to be false, right? So that's never going to happen. So what do we what do we do if we want something to happen when something else does not happen? There's got to be a better way to say that. Yes. Yeah, there we go. Even though I did not say it in a very, very, very even though I did not say it in a very clear manner, Sam still got it. System dot out dot print line. Two is not less than one. Ah. What, what is this complaining about here? Obviously, it's dead code. <laughs> it's just practice. I need to stop using the word obviously. It's not obvious to everyone. It's only obvious because I've been doing this for da too damn long. <laughs> All right, now if we run this, compile run, two is not less than one. All right, is everyone good? Give folks a minute to run that. Looking good. You got an error. Let me take a look for you. Didn't save? You did save. Oh, look at that checklist going. All right. Yes. Yep. That's the next one on your checklist. So for those who will be following online, um, we have kind of a checklist of when you run into errors. One, did you save? Do you see the little white dot at the top of your file? Two, did you compile it? And then three, want to add to your checklist, if you haven't been doing this already, or if you've been doing this already, is uh, do you have semicolons at the end of your lines? It's a common problem. Everyone, it, it, it affects everyone at one point or another. You good, Catherine? Oh, all right, let me take a look. All right, so we're good here. Um, now, this isn't everything that we covered in the slides. This is just a little bit of practice to kind of get you used to it, get you more comfortable with it. Um, the code that I post online is going to have all the examples that we covered in the slides, or the code that's already posted online that you'll be able to reference after fact, OK? This is not the code I'm going to post online, because this is actually less than what I did in the past. So I'm going to send you the more full version from the past, OK? Going back, questions about if else? Going once, going twice, cool. Now, um, I mentioned that you can nest things. When we say nest, uh, and I apologize if I've used this before without explaining it, nesting just means doing something inside something else, okay? Um, 
So in this example, we have five less than 10 as one condition, and then five mod two, which will get the remainder of five being divided by two. Since it's an odd number, that will be one. Um, we have a condition inside a condition, right? And so this is totally valid. You can totally do this, no problem, OK? Um, in the real world, you would not want to write this quite this way. Um, you would, oh, no, go away, go away, go away. I can't see the, OK, I'm just not going to move my mouse. There we go. So at the last line that I'm not going to point out with my mouse, um, you see we can use the double ampersands, the logical and operator, to combine the two conditions, OK? Both of these will work. All right, you can either have that whole bottom line in one condition, or you can have two conditions with one inside the other. All of the above works, okay? Questions about that? No questions? I'm gonna give people a second to look at it. All right, cool. I'm going to move on, all right? All right, so that's it for if else. Done. If you understand that, you understand that side of conditions. Next up is switch case. Very similar to if else with some small differences and maybe some things that can help make your code a little bit cleaner. Um, it's basically a simpler way to do chained conditions if you're only checking a single value. Okay, If you're checking multiple values or if you're doing functions and all that sort of stuff, you can't really use switch case. But if you're just checking one value and checking possible, or if you're checking just one variable and you're checking possible values for it, switch case works. And it's a bit cleaner and a bit easier to read. So the way it works is you switch on some variable. Okay, You have some variable and you say, this is what I want to check for a whole bunch of different possible values. And each of those possible values is called a case. So in case it's this, do that. In case it's this, do that. In case it's a different value, do a different thing, OK? In English, you could say it as, in the case my variable is 1, do this. In the case my variable is 2, do that. Now, you don't have to use only numbers. There's all sorts of stuff you can use. But that's the logic to it, OK? This can be much easier to read and to type than doing a whole bunch of if, 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 else if. Else if, else if, else if, else if, else if. It has the same effect, it's just a bit cleaner with one minor feature change. Um, the main difference between the two is that there's the concept of fall through, where if you have one case as true, okay, you can have it run the code for that case, but then you can also have it run code for the next case as well if you want it to, okay? It'll fall through into the next case. Okay, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense now, but we'll, we'll get to it in a second, okay? But in this way, you can have multiple cases execute their logic if one of them is true, okay? So what does this look like? This is a switch case. So at the top, you have your switch and the variable that you want to switch on, okay? In this case, I have some theoretical calling application, okay? And I say call status is finished. And then I want to switch on the value of that. In the case that call status is equal to in progress, then do this. OK? Now, there's a special keyword called break. OK? And break means to get out of the current thing. OK? It works for switch. It doesn't work for everything. Like, break doesn't work for functions, for example. But it does work for switch. And in this case, if call status is equal to in progress, it will execute this, and then it will exit the case because of the break. Okay, the break causes it to exit the case. All right. In the event that call status has failed, it will print this, and then because there's no break, it will continue and then run log call status. Okay, that's the fall through. Okay, so we only stop executing code in a case if we hit a break, all right? Otherwise, we just keep going. So you can think of this case statement as where to start. And the break tells where to finish, OK? Does that make sense? Cool. 
So in the case that it's finished, it'll start here instead, do log call status, and then break. One more thing about case, if call status is not equal to any of those values, you have a default option, okay? What to do by default if none of the above cases are true? And it will execute that, okay? You don't need a default. It's just optional, but often it's useful, okay? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, so for those in the recording, Sam was asking. Uh, Sam studying Python as well, and uh, he was asking if this is the same as uh, switch case and break in Python. And the answer is generally yes. I forget the details of Python switch case. Um, but conceptually, it's the same. Yeah, so the, the concepts we're covering here are the same in many languages. Yeah, not every language, but most of them. Um, so it's actually advantageous for you guys to study Java, because Java is a little bit harder to start with than other languages, like Python, for example. And I think we talked about this during the first meeting, but um, it's easier to go from Java to another language, right? So if you if you learn Java and then you switch to Python, that's way easier than starting with Python and switching to Java. Um, so now, but having said that, Python or Java is harder to learn at the beginning than Python is. But the concepts are the same between both, or at the very least, similar. And so you just have to learn what the differences are, and then you can write in the language. And you'll find that the more languages you learn, um, you'll be able to see the common concepts of, among all of them, and it won't be a problem. For example, the other night, I did a programming interview in Ruby. I've written maybe 10 lines of Ruby in my life, but I passed a coding interview because I know like five or six different programming languages, right? So the concepts are the same, and it's just like, oh, how do I write this concept in this way in this language? And that's it. Okay. Question. Uh, so does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Any other questions on that topic before we move forward? Cool. Um, I don't want to go too far forward because, uh, oh, damn. Okay. So um, let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, code one of these real quick. So if we go back to our conditions file, hmm. after our condition over here, let's uh, let's let's define a new variable. Let's make it an integer called um, whatever my number. Not terribly interesting, but it'll work. And let's uh, let's start with setting it to let's set it to five, okay? This is the only thing we've added, Jihei. You haven't missed much. All right, and then we're gonna switch on the on that variable, okay? And then after that, you got to do your curly brackets. Give people a minute to catch up. You good? All right. So now, in, in case that my number is 1, we're going to system.out.println. My number is one. Let me scroll down here a little bit, make it easier for folks to see. Actually, you know what? Let's change this to a one or more. Okay, because I want to I want to demonstrate the fall through. 
And then let's do a case where um, let's do a case where it's three and system dot out dot print line. Um, my number is three or more. And let's do a case of five. And then after this one, let's break. Does everyone give, give folks some time to type that out? As I get caught on my cables. Wait, what is it caught on? Oh, oh! Oh, that, that just changed my life. Where can I clip this? I'm gonna clip this somewhere, it's gonna be great. Clip, aw oh, yeah. All right, has everyone got that typed up? All right, let's do another case, case of 10. System.out.println, my number is 10. And then uh, let's do a default. System.out.println. Oh, oops, 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 oops. I forgot a, I forgot a break. My number is... Not one, three, five, or ten. Oh, that's not a that's not a three. That's a three. Arabic numerals are hard. We should all switch to Roman numerals. Totally. All right, so has everyone got that? Still typing? Now, some, some things that I kind of didn't mention here. After your case, you want to have this colon here, right? And then uh, don't forget your semicolon after the break. Now, if you don't see any red squiggly lines, you're probably OK. If you see red squiggly lines, that might be the issue. I kind of skip over some stuff and rely on folks being observant. That's a habit I got to break myself of. So I, I apologize if I forget to mention small things like that, because while small, they are critically important. Reminds me of a story. A monk went to his master, and the master was working on a very small problem. And the master had been working on it for a long time. And the monk says, why do you spend all of your time solving this tiny little problem? Like, you, you tell us not to waste our time with things. And the master looks at the monk, sees he's not wearing shoes. He has a staff. He slams his staff down on the monk's pinky toe. And in that moment, the monk was enlightened. Because just because it's small doesn't mean it doesn't hurt a lot or that it's not important. What's up? Uh, All right. Let me come take a look at that.
Try running it if you haven't already. And you should get uh, my number is one or more. My or no, you should get a. Uh... Oh, my uh, my 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 printing is wrong. Oops, my printing is way wrong. Sorry about that. Um, my my number is one. My number is one or three. There we go. Sorry, I messed that up. My number is one, three, or five. There we go. An Oxford comma for the win. Sorry about that, folks. I, I messed up my logic there. Now, I'll give people a second to type. It's looking like we might go a little bit over time because we started late. For people in the recording, it's not going to matter, for, but for the people here on site, hopefully that doesn't cause too much trouble. Oops. Okay, so is everyone... Correct. Let me see what you got. All right, so does everyone get a uh, correct output? My number is one, three, or five. Good. Is anyone not getting that? Still doing it? All right. Good. All right. Now, I got a question for folks. If I change my number to one, I'm, I'm sure you can just, based on the logging output, read to me what happens. But can can someone explain to me the stepwise, step by step, how it ha how it progresses? If I set my number to one, what happens? So it'll it'll go to case one, and then what will happen? What what line will it run next? Yep, it'll it'll so it'll do this, and then it will continue to case three, and then what? It'll print this, and then it'll continue to case five, and then what? Correct. It will hit break, and what will happen when it hits break? Right. So once it hits break, it will exit the switch. All right. So let's test and make sure that's true. Looking good. Sorry? Let me look at what you got. So just to be just to be super clear, changing my number to one is what we did to change the behavior and demonstrate the fall through. It starts with case one, and then it runs what's under case one. Because there's no break, it just keeps going. So it doesn't care about this, so it's going to run this. There's still no break, so it's going to keep going. It skips this, runs this, and then it hits a break, so then it stops. If we change this to three, it would instead start here. 
Run this. No break, so keep going. Run this. Break. Okay, stop. If we changed it to 10, it would start here. Run this. Hit the break. And then stop. Okay? In the case that it's some other number, like 2 or 7, it doesn't match any of these cases. So it will instead go to default. And this will print out. Now, switch case is really nice for kind of learning because you can just change this number and watch the results to kind of test it out. So if you're having trouble remembering how this works, just mess with this variable and you'll be able to see how it works again. Okay? Questions? Feeling good? All right. You guys are doing pretty good. Usually this stuff is a little more challenging for folks. So that is it for conditions. If you understand the if else sort of stuff and the switch case stuff, you are good on conditions. So good job, folks. But we still got 30 minutes and half the lesson to go through. So let's hurry up. What is a loop? Loops are how you can repeat things in your program. Okay. If I want to do something a thousand times, that sucks. That's going to be a long time, right? Computers are way faster. And this is where loops are hugely useful. Okay. There's two kinds of loops, for loops and while loops. And as I mentioned before, there are different kind of subtypes of these loops, but we're only going to cover a couple of them. Okay. Later, if you want to learn more subtypes, you can learn that on your own. We're going to teach the core basics. And if you understand that, learning the subtypes on your own will be easy. Okay. Everyone good? All right. So first, we're going to start with the while loop. Okay. It's a bit simpler to write, a little more complicated to use. Okay. While loops continue running while their condition is true. This is why we teach conditions and loops together, because conditions are really important to them. Okay. Similar to a switch case, you can use break to exit a while loop. Okay. So if you have something happening in a while loop, you can use a condition and then say break, and it'll break out of the while loop. Okay. Um, alternatively, if there's something happening in your while loop and you want to skip to the next run of it, you can use the continue keyword. Okay. It's not used very often, but when you do need it, it's really helpful. Okay. Another thing is you can create infinite loops, loops that will run forever, which is good for things like web servers. And then you can stop them with a break whenever you're ready, right? However, be careful, because if a loop runs infinitely and you don't have a way to break out of it, your program's just going to keep running forever and ever and ever, OK? And you may not want that all the time. So here's an example. Don't, don't, don't write this, <laughs> OK? But actually, this is a good opportunity to teach something. On terminal, if you're running a program and you want it to stop, control C, true of both Mac and Windows. Control C is your friend. Not Command C on Mac, Control C. Okay. That will that the the high level brief version is it tells the program to stop running. Uh, the low level stuff is um, it sends it sends an interrupt signal and then if the program has an interrupt signal handler it'll do that and then stop running. That's way more complicated than a lot of people need. So Control C, stop running the program. Good? All right. Moving forward. Oh. Um, so I didn't do the whole arrow pointing thing here, but a while loop is pretty simple. You have the while keyword, followed by, similar to an if, you have the parentheses with some condition. OK, this should be some true, false, some Boolean value. And then whatever's in here will repeat over and over and over again. OK? Questions about that? Cool. All right. Something that's not an infinite loop. Um, we're going to create a counter variable. We're going to start at a 0. And then as long as counter is less than 5, we're going to keep going. OK? So I'm doing some print statement. And then I'm increasing counter by 1. This is just a little side thing I'm teaching you. Remember how we learned plus equals 1? It's the same as writing counter equals counter plus 1. Counter plus plus is a shortcut even for that. Now, the difference is you can do plus equals 1 or 2 or 20 or a million or whatever. 
plus plus is always one. Okay, so it's only a short shortcut for that case. Okay, so all three of these things I have written here are the same. Okay, so what'll happen is at the the last step of the loop, it'll add one to counter, and then it'll start over. It will check the value of counter again. If it's still less than five, it'll run what's in here. And then when this finishes, it'll go back to the beginning, check counter again. If it's still less than five, run again. Loop, 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 loop. Does that make sense? Okay. So how many times will this print, even though I totally wrote it? <laughs> five times. Yep. What will it print? Followed by? Right, but for each iteration of the loop, for each time the loop runs, when, when a loop runs, we call it an iteration, okay? On the first iteration, the first time it runs, what will counter be? Zero, okay? And then after that, what will be the second time? Yep, what will it be the third time? What will it be the fourth time? What will it be the fifth time? And then what will happen next? Right, why? Correct, you got it. Does that make sense to everyone? Cool, all right, let's move forward. There is a subtype of while called do while, okay? So while, if I started counter at like five or six, this would not run at all. It would just skip it, okay? Because this condition would not be true. So you'd have zero iterations. It would not run even once. Do while kind of flips things. You say do, and then you have your block, and then you have your condition at the end. This will run it at least one time, and then it will check the condition to see if it should continue again, okay? This is a useful one. Again, not very often, but when you do need it, it's helpful, okay? So in this case, counter is zero. We're only gonna continue looping if counter is less than zero, but because we're doing a do while, this will still run one time and then it'll check the condition, the condition will fail, and it'll move on. It won't repeat the loop. Does that make sense? Cool, questions? Mm. So, so that, that means I messed up. So, do, the, the difference between while and do while is do while guarantees it runs at least one time, regardless of the condition. The condition can be while false, right? And this will still run one time. So it runs it one time and then it checks the condition to see if it should continue. Does that answer your question? Cool. Other questions? Cool. All right, moving forward. So that, that's the while loop. Um, let's actually, uh, let's do an example real quick. Or do we have time? Uh, I'm just gonna have to hope that you guys can do it with homework, okay? So we're gonna move, so that's the while loop and the do while subtype, okay? Moving forward to for loops, okay? This is more difficult to write than a while loop. There's a lot more stuff to type, but you're likely going to use this more often, okay? Because a while loop, you kind of don't know when it's going to end. For a for loop, you have, you're you normally like, dude, I have 20 things and I just want to do it for these 20 things. That's usually what you use a for loop for, okay? Um, now for loop looks like this at the bottom here, okay? You have the for keyword followed by some parentheses and a bunch of junk inside those, okay? And then similar to a while, you have the curly brackets and whatever's in the curly brackets will repeat, okay? 
Now, this stuff, this is the confusing part. This is the hard part, okay? That's why I color coded it, <laughs> because hopefully it will make some sense. A lot of people have trouble understanding this, okay? So we want to spend more time making sure you get it, okay? Inside the parentheses part, inside the for loop, okay? There are three parts. They're separated by semicolons, okay? The three parts are the initialization, what it does before the loop starts, okay? The continuation condition, this is similar to the while loop, what needs to be true for me to keep going? And then I call it the iteration step. After things finish running, what do I do before I start the next step? Okay? So looking at this for loop right here, this is a very common one, okay? Such that like people know that when they see the letter I, they know they're in a for loop because it's super, super common to write it like this, okay? So this says, in our loop, and only inside our loop, we're going to create a variable called i. It's going to be an integer. It's going to start as 0. Okay? That's the initialization. Okay? Now, i will only exist inside the loop. Okay? Outside of the loop, i will not exist. This is scoping. Okay? And we're going to cover scoping a little more later, but for now, that's an important piece to know. That's the initialization, the yellow part. The green part, the continuation condition. If this uh, part is true, if evaluates to true, so i is less than 5, then it will continue. If it is not true, it won't run the loop again, and it'll continue to whatever else is in your code. It'll continue on. Okay? And the last part, the iteration step, is after it's finished running everything in the curly brackets, it'll run that code. OK? Does that make sense? In this case, i++ means add 1 to i. OK? So who can tell me what this loop will do? So in the first, in the first iteration, what is i equal to? 0, correct. So what will it print? Correct. What's going to happen next? Yep. So i++ happens. i gets increased from 0 to 1. Uh, i is still less than 5, so it continues. And it will run again with i as 1. Correct. You, your, your answer is absolutely correct. I just wanted to be super explicit about it. Okay. After that, what happens? Correct. And at what point will I, what is the last value that I will be before it stops? Four. Correct. Very good. Questions about that? Do you guys feel like you understand this one? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> That's a relief. Because <laughs> this is really hard to teach. Good. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, I think the color coding helps. <laughs> That's the first time I've done it with the color coding, so. Um, all right, cool. Are we good to? Oh, one last thing. Uh, similar to while loops, we can still use break and continue. Okay, so so if in our in our for loop, if we have something happen and we decide we want to break, you write the break. It'll exit the loop. Okay, regardless of what i is, right, or whatever the value is. It doesn't have to be i. It can be whatever you want. Um, and then continue means don't run the rest of the code in the loop. Just skip to the next iteration. OK, so it would stop running what's there, go back, increase i++, or do, run i++, so increase i by 1, and then start the next iteration of the loop. OK, that's what continue does. Questions about that? 
Good? Cool. All right, so now we got 15 minutes. Let's do some practice. Uh, let's see. Where's my example? Here we go. All right, what we're going to do, my friends, Why didn't I just, okay. Um, I want you to make a new file. It can be in the same folder. Call it loops.java. Or I'm, I'm sorry, don't call it loops. Uh, let's call it fizzbuzz.java. Oh, that's cool. Well, thank you, Visual Studio. That's awful nice of you. It just wrote that for me. You don't need the public if you don't want it. Now, why did I call this FizzBuzz? There's a programming interview question. It's very popular. It's called FizzBuzz, okay? It's used for very, very junior people just to show that you can code in whatever language it is, okay? So if you can do this, you're pretty good, all right? We're gonna do this together now, all right? So let's write our main function. Does someone who's not Sam want to try to Call it out. Public, yep. Not quite yet. Try again. Static, yep. Teamwork is good. Keep going, guys. Void, yep. Yeah, wow. And then what? Uh, wh say again. One thing before that. Args needs a type. Begins with an S. String. Yep. And then it's a it's an array of strings. You haven't learned arrays yet, but it's square brackets and then args. Okay. Good job, guys. That was that was really good because you guys haven't been studying it, so that's just practice memory. Great job. All right. Um, now it's not it's not going to be true fizzbuzz because. Um, we're not going to do the whole command line. Actually, wait, can we? Uh, no, 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 because I haven't taught you guys arrays yet. It's not going to be true fizzbuzz. It's just going to be kind of close to fizzbuzz. Okay. So let's uh, let's define an integer and let's call it a uh, let's just call it my number because I'm not feeling creative right now. And uh, let's set it to one. Okay. Uh, once you've done that, let me explain what fizzbuzz is. The fizzbuzz problem. Again, very common programming problem. And it works like this. Um, actually, sorry, we're not going to use int my number one. Sorry about that. Um, given some number, if the number is divisible by three, print fizz. If the number is divisible by five, print buzz. If the number is divisible by three and five, print fizzbuzz. If none of those are true, just print the number. Okay? That's the fizzbuzz problem. Okay? We're going to do a kind of strange fizzbuzz. Okay? Because we're going to, normally you just write a function, and that function takes in the fizzbuzz number, and then you print the output. But instead, what we're going to do is we're going to loop through a bunch of numbers and do fizzbuzz for each number. Okay? So let's write a loop. Uh, we're going to use int i, just as convention. And we're going to start it at 0. I'm sorry, that's not true. Uh, yeah, let's start it at 1. Mm -hmm. Let's start it at 1 instead of 0. And then let's do i uh, less than or equal to 10. So this is going to start at 1 and go up to and including 10. OK, so it's going to be a little bit different than usual. And then we're going to do i++. Sorry, one second, the sign fell again.
All right, next, we're going to do if uh, i divided by 3 is 0. That means if it's divisible by 3, if we divide it by 3 and there's nothing remaining, OK? And system.out.println is. All right, now let's test this, okay? So let's do, as usual, Java C, fizz buzz dot Java, and then Java fizz buzz. Oops, I'm going to add a little space here just for readability. A little bit easier to read. Now, again, we're, we're not finished with FizzBuzz. We're doing this step by step. And again, this is not true FizzBuzz. It's just kind of FizzBuzz-like. OK, let me see what your error is. It would have taken me an eternity to find. All right, so is everyone able to run it and they get fizz printed three times? No? All right, let me see what you got. Now, um, this is not quite what we want, right? So step by step. So we got it working for the case of three. Let's get it working for the else cases, OK, when it's not three or five. So let's do an else, system.out.println, and then i, OK? I should not have named this FizzBuzz because it's not true FizzBuzz, and I'm a little, little worried about you guys getting confused in the future if you use this as a reference. So maybe at the end we'll rename it, but for now we're not going to worry about it. We'll, maybe we'll call it like Fancy FizzBuzz or something. All right, so if you run this, you should get 1 through 10 with the numbers divisible by 3 replaced with Fizz. Has everyone got that? Sorry? Oh? Oh, 
takes practice. All right, has everyone got this running? Good job. All right. So uh, now let's handle the five case, okay? So let's do, uh, in kind of the middle here, let's handle five, else if I mod five is zero. And based on what we said about fizzbuzz, what do we want to print here? You guys remember? Everyone's too focused on getting this typed out. It's all right. Um, so in the case of three, we want to print fizz. Do you remember what we wanted to print in the case of five? Yep. Now that's not necessarily a programming question, but it is important to remember the requirements when you're writing your program. All right, so don't forget to save and then try running it. And your output should look like this. One, two, fizz, four, buzz, fizz, seven, eight, fizz, buzz. How are we doing on time? No, we're doing pretty good. We'll be maybe like five minutes over. Good, you got that? Good job, guys. Now, in the case where it's divisible by three or five, or I'm sorry, three and five, we have, I mean, there's a lot of ways to do this, but for purposes of our example, let's do, uh, Let's do something like this. Okay, so I'm kind of laying out the structure here. Now I want, uh, I want you guys to get to do this part first to get the syntax figured out and then we'll work on the logic. So get this typed up and then we'll Has everyone got that typed up so far? All right, now, if I want to check if it's divisible by both three and five, who can tell me what I need to write? Yep, mod. And and this is not this is not evaluate to a boolean yet. Almost, we're missing a part. Nope. Remember, we want to check if both of these things are true, right? So, how much how much of how much of this is this? The highlighting kind of does it for you. <laughs> Yep, yep, because this will give the remainder of i by 3, right? That's going to be a number, right? Is a number a Boolean? No, a number is not a Boolean. A number is not true or false. This comparison operator, this equality comparison, that will produce a true or false. So this is going, it's going to do this math here, 
that's going to be some number. And then it's going to, comp it's going to use, using this, compare this number to this number. Then if they're the same, this whole thing will evaluate to true. Does that make sense? Does it really? Cool. You think it does? OK, so let's, let's walk through it step by step. Let's, let's say we're in the first iteration where i is 1. OK, so i is going to be 1. Then it's going to do i mod 3. OK, so i is what again? What? 1. So what is 1 mod 3? 1 divided by 3, what's the remainder? Right, the, but just walking through it step by step. What's 1 divided by 3 remainder? It'd be 1, right? So if I do, if I do 1 divided by th or mod 3, that's going to be, or actually, let's do it this way. So if I do old, like, elementary school style, right? So 1 divided by 3, right? So how many times is 3 going to 1? 0, all right? So 3 times 0 is what? So what's left over? 1, so my remainder is 1. OK, your remainder is what this gets. OK, does that, do you guys remember now? Man, I haven't written that in like years. That's cool. <laughs> All right, so 1 mod 3 is what? 2 mod 3 is what? 3 mod 3. Correct. 4 mod 3. Correct. You get the pattern? Cool. So, I apologize for those on the, those on the video. You're not going to see that. Um, so, when i is 1, what does this evaluate to? 1. Is 1, when comparing 1 to 0, is that going to create a true value or a false value? False. False. So then it'll skip this, right? Just making sure you guys understand step by step. Feel good now? Cool. All right, now we want to check if both of these conditions are true. So this is one condition. So you had mentioned earlier, how do we check for both? And and, yep. And then we do the other condition. I'll let me know when you guys have this typed out. Good? All right, so now if we run this, we're not going to see any change because um, none of our numbers are divisible by 3 and 5. All right? So let's go, instead of 10, let's go to 30. Let's, let's go big, OK? Or not to 10, up to and including 10. Let's go up to and including 30, all right? Right up here, all right? Because we previously we told i to stop or i to keep going as long as it's less than or equal to ten. Now we want to tell it to keep going as long as it's less than or equal to thirty. Does that make sense? Cool. All 
All right, so now if we run this, we're going to get a lot more numbers, but you'll see that 30 is fizzbuzz. And then we keep going up. You can see the fizz and the buzz and the fizzbuzz. My scrolling is absolutely absurd. So one, two, fizz, four, buzz, fizz, seven, eight, fizz, buzz, 11, fizz, 13, 14, fizz, buzz. Looking good. So yeah, good job, guys. You actually did a kind of harder version of fizzbuzz. Because <laughs> fizzbuzz usually doesn't have the loop. Fizzbuzz, you just have a function and then take in a number and do your conditions. Um, now, yeah. What's up? Is one is really bus, not, not fizz bus. Awesome. Let me see what you got. So while Sam's working on fixing his stuff, uh, I'm going to add, uh, this isn't really a big deal, but um, I'm worried that if we don't fix this and you go look at this again later, you may get confused. This is not the classic fizzbuzz problem. It's just very similar. So I want to rename this so you don't get confused later, OK? So change this from fizzbuzz to like fancy fizzbuzz or something like that, OK? Or not fancy, let's be more descriptive, looping fizzbuzz. OK? And then over here on the left side, right click or maybe command or control click if you're on Mac and do rename fizzbuzz.java. We're going to rename it to looping fizzbuzz.java. OK? And then to make sure it works, Java C, looping fizzbuzz.java. And then Java looping fizzbuzz. Cool. I'm gonna scroll back up so you can see the commands in case you have a typo so you can compare. Wah. There we go. Giving people some time to get stuff typed out and fixed. All right. So, in terms of what we're teaching, that's it for today. Good job, everyone. Today you learned about conditions, if else statements, and switch case statements. You learned about the two main kinds of loops while loops and for loops, and you even did a little bit of fizz buzz, which is a fun little interview question. All right, but next is homework. All right, you're going to create a new class 
and therefore a new file called my random number checker. And you're going to create a main function for it like usual. Okay? You're going to create a variable called my random number. And uh, you know what? I have a slight bug here. That is an integer. And store the output from this code in it. Okay? You don't necessarily need to understand this. Uh, you can just copy and paste this part. Okay? This is generating a random number. Uh, math.random generates a number between 0 and 1 that's random. You multiply it by 10, you get a single digit random number, and then we're cutting off the decimal. But you don't need to know all that. You can just copy paste this. Okay? Then write a while loop that continues to run if my random number is less than 7. Okay? If my random number is 5, skip to the next iteration. Okay? Hint, you're going to want to use the continue keyword. Remember, continue is to skip. If my random number is even, print that it's even along with printing the number. Okay? Otherwise, print that my random number is odd. Okay? This one's a little tricky, but I think you guys can do it. Okay? If you have questions, you can always ask us on Discord. Okay? Does everyone feel good? You feel like you can do this? You can try. Yeah. Ah. Uh, <laughs> oh no no. Yeah. Yeah. So for for those watching the video, uh, Sam was basically saying that he started working on the homework this morning and he realized it was not enough time to finish it before the class. So he's going to start it earlier. Um, but yeah, that's good feedback. Um, maybe maybe I should make the homework. Uh, instead of having one big problem that tries to incorporate everything, maybe it would be better to have a series of smaller problems. However, I also want you guys to be able to mix and match all of these things. So, um, but that is good feedback. Um, I, I'm debating whether or not it's good for it to take longer. Like, it might be good for you to spend more time practicing and working on it. But I also know that we all have lives, and this is a free thing, and like... You don't have a huge amount of time to spend on this. So um, I'll, I'll think about what you told me, and I'll see if we want to change things up. We may not, but I'll consider it. So thank you for mentioning that, Sam. Uh, any questions about this while you're looking at it now? You can always ask questions later, so don't be too worried if you're not able to think of anything. Good? All right. So. Uh, additional resources uh, per, I forget if it was, I forget who gave me the suggestion last time, but one of you guys gave me the suggestion last time of adding additional resources. So I've added that now. Um, these are all different tutorials of the same content. So if you're finding that what's written in the presentation doesn't really make sense to you, try one of these ones instead. Okay. And uh, any questions about everything we covered today? Cool. All right. As usual, thank you very much for coming or for watching if you're on the video. Again, we are Code Soul. We are a registered nonprofit, and we run on donations from folks like you. Um, if you want to donate, here's the info. Also, a big thank you to W Coding for allowing us to use this space. As usual, I should tell you that if you want to learn things faster and if you have the money for it, you should totally check out their boot camp. Uh, it's a... Uh, uh, I forget how long it is, but they have an intensive program where you spend like uh, a significant amount of time, it's like having a full-time job, um, every week learning programming from an excellent instructor and learning how to work on a team and build a project. You're not just copying code and following tutorials online, you're actually working together with people to build real projects. So, um, and that's an excellent way to learn. So if you feel like that's your thing and if you have the time and money for it, I do recommend it. Um, otherwise, we love to have you here and uh, good luck in your studies.